Hello everyone and welcome and thank you for joining us for lecture number 30 in this lockdown series which is a bit crazy um, but great as well. Um, I just, I'll just quickly remind you of our hashtag um, which is conservation together at home. So uh, now I'm going to introduce today's speaker, Rita Udina. Rita is a paper and book conservator based in Barcelona in Spain. And she's run her own private conservation lab since 1999, where she's worked for archives, museums, libraries, and private collectors. Rita organizes international conservation courses at her studio, as well as in collaboration with institutions in the Netherlands, France, and Spain. She enjoys sharing conservation through conferences, papers, and on social media, and particularly on her blog, which you can find at ritaudina.com, which I highly recommend you all check out. It's really wonderful. Um, and she's got followers from all over the world on there. Um, so that without further ado, I'm going to unmute you, Rita, and you can get started. Okay, we should be able to hear you now. Hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Holly, for this nice introduction. And thanks the book and paper group as well for this super fruitful uh, experience. This talk uh, this lecture was held first in 2014 in the Symposium Technical Drawings and their Reproductions in The Hague. So I want to thank first the uh, Restaurator in Netherlands because they gave me the chance for, they gave me this first chance. Oops, I cannot run the, ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> so here's the leaflet from, from that symposium. In that occasion, all the study cases that I collected and explained belong to the associations of architects of Catalonia, to whom I am mostly grateful uh, for the trust they give me and the opportunity to work on amazing works of art they have. Now, uh, I have added and updated that lecture with some other study cases from other institutions that, uh, of course, I, I also want to acknowledge. Centre Grau Garriga d'Art Textil Contemporani de Sant Cugat, the Municipal Archive of Errenteria in the Basque Country, and Museums of Sitges in Barcelona. And here, you see this uh, sticky post in pink, whenever you see this along the conference, it means that uh, you have the full reference at the end. So in the sticky post, uh, it's the name of the author and that's it, and you have it at the end. Let's begin. So if we ask uh, an occasional user of a collection, what are in impregnated tracing paper, um, they might tell us that it's just a translucent paper which is meant uh, to trace on it and it's mostly used for architects, engineers, designers and it's usually um, a work in progress document. It's never meant to be the final design or, or the final um, result of the project. What if we ask the same question to someone who is more expert on the topic? Okay, they, uh, and here, I, I hope you see my mouse. So you see yeah. here, these sticky posts, uh, these are the ones I was referring to before, and you will see them all along the PowerPoint. So this refers to the article by uh, Hildegard Homburger and uh, Colbert, and as well another article by Wilson. This would be 
three experts <laughs> that could reply to the question. So if we ask them, for instance, they would tell us that um, transparency is a matter of the refraction index of the matter. So if we have the same refraction index, then we get translucency. If it changes, then the matter becomes opaque. How can we achieve this evenness in a paper? One of them is by applying a high pressure in the moment of, pro of production. So if there are no air gaps between the fibers, we get this evenness in the refraction index. So high pressure and calendaring would be one method, mechanical method. A second method would be a chemical digesting of the cellulose, which uh, produces a byproducts, a colloidal sort of gelatin that is embedded as well in the air gaps of the, between the fibers. And then we get this translucency. And the third method would be to add a coating to the paper that is in filling all the gaps. And this coating has a similar refraction index to that one of cellulose, therefore uh, obtaining transparency. Because of the coating that usually or often it's uh, an oil, you can um, hear the different names of oiled paper, prepared paper, vellum paper, because it's sort of similar to parchment, the appearance, as well as impregnated paper. Uh, this, this type of paper is referred in the literature from the medieval ages, the first, um, quote or mention is an, an art manual from the 12th century, but we also find some references to it by Cennini and many others. The type of uh, oils that were commonly used uh, were natural vegetable oils, many different kinds, waxes, as well as natural raisins. raisins not raisins, resins, not yeah, resins. Um, at the, um, at, at, this is at the early uh, stage of production that was manual. Later on, the vegetable and natural resins were changed by mineral and synthetic resins that after time have proven to be much more stable. And here we have um, an advert from 1925 that is already warning us of how not stable these papers were already in the production moment. And it's not surprising because in, um, in the process of producing it, they would not only soak uh, the varnish. So after applying the varnish, they would wash it with bleaching agents. And this bleaching, apart from removing the remnants of oil, would um, bleach and turn it whiter because it already was becoming yellow uh, because of the oil. And at the last stage of production of the, of the tracing paper, the impregnated tracing paper, the, the, the coating present on the paper oxidized and polymerized, uh, becoming solid. And within this process, the cellulose fibers weakened very much. And so we read this advert from a Canson paper that says that their papers will not uh, become yellow or brittle with age, and they are white. So we have a paper from the same age, just one year before, and it's probably not from Canson and Vidalon because it's very yellow <laughs> and very brittle. <laughs> and because of this brittleness, 
every single fold or bend turns into tears. And because so many tears and so many folds, uh, we usually find many, 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 many pressure sensitive tapes. So we have asked uh, occasional users and experts, and what do conservators know about impregnated tracing paper? Ah, we know that we dislike them a lot. We don't like them. <laughs> and I don't know if any of you have had experience with them, but here's uh, the reasons why I don't uh, like them. Well, yeah, now, now I am, I'm getting a bit familiar to them, but the main, well, the first reason is because, um, because of the solidification of the varnish, whenever there's a small wrinkle, this coating cracks and becomes um, whitish. And there's no way to remove this whitish thing because it's the, the, pow the powdery coating. Uh, often, these wrinkles and bends and falls are even more visible than, than the design itself. And of course, I mean, this, no, we don't want this. And because of the um, solidification of the varnish, it's not only that they are visible, it's also that it's really difficult to flatten. I mean, this distortion of the paper is not easily flattened. The tears and, and cuts produced are super sharp. And this is an inconvenience regarding the mending for, for the conservator, because it's really difficult to overlap the fibers from each side of the paper, because the varnish doesn't allow us to do that, and, and it's really sharp. And we have this oil all the time, that uh, makes any uh, wet treatment less efficient. It's not that we cannot mend with starch paste. Yes, we can, but it's less efficient because it receives less water. It's sort of waterproof. We cannot really work with water, but we cannot work with solvent either because of the varnish. <laughs> And because of the varnish, here in, in this detailed example, this square is showing uh, a spot in which I removed a tape that I will discuss later on. And uh, after removing the tape, that particular spot loses transparency. So we cannot really apply solvents easily either. But if any of these uh, explanations is not enough for you, here's the main one. Uh, I don't like this kind of paper because they are horribly brittle. It's really annoying to handle them. And since just the photo doesn't really show how fragile they are, at some point I decided that I would take a video of the previous day. I hope you can hear the noise of the video as well. And it really tells us that the varnish is sort of like glass. I mean, it's really stiff and, and, and turns the paper to a, a most fragile object. Because all of these conservators don't like these papers. So we have this varnish that provides extreme oxidation and in, as a consequence of this oxidation, really low pH. It provides us transparency as well, brittleness and yellowing. And from all these features, we only appreciate transparency. The rest, no, we, it's drawbacks that we don't really know. And uh, this varnish compromises any equus treatment as well. So at some point, I thought, okay, why not removing the varnish? 
uh, it will help us get closer to the goals we want to achieve, which are uh, reducing the redox uh, oxidation on the paper and, if we can, retrieve or revert the oxidation that it has, ha, has gone through. Uh, and this means um, getting a higher pH if we can. Transparency, we don't really want to uh, change it. And we would like it to be more flexible. The more flexible the paper is, the less reinforcement layers will be needed. So in return, it will be more easily uh, kept translucent. Uh, the more flexible it is, we can um, handle it safer, of course. But what if we apply aqueous treatment and there is a modification of the scale? This is something we really need to bear in mind because most of these drawings are technical drawings and the scale is paramount, is the main information most of the time. And what about yellowing? Well, I don't consider yellowing a, a damage in itself. No, it's, it's, not, it's, it's rather a, a consequence of a, something harmful on the paper. But we must not neglect that it's somehow distorting the, the document. First of all, because it lessens the black and white contrast. And secondly, because in case of colored papers, the yellowish glazing is distorting. So here, you see this is the watercolor. And well, this is a screen, so maybe you don't see well, but it might seem the same grayish color, but no, this part is blue and this part is black. This is after conservation. So we cannot say that we don't really mind about yellowing because it is really distorting at some point the, the document. Okay, so now we have introduced the, pap the, the paper, the tracing paper, the features and our goals with the treatment, our concerns. So this is the first study case. I will have some water. This is a late paper impregnated. I mean, it could be any paper to be impregnated. So this is a, an impregnated late paper in ink watercolor from 1918, and it belongs to the Association of Architects of Catalonia. Catalonia. As you can see, it was really brittle and in many fragments, around eight fragments. This is a um, trace that I did of the tracing paper before the any conservation treatment to have an, uh, an accurate idea of the position of, of each fragment. And this is just the single trace that I did on the mylar. And I would like you to um, keep this, um, this mylar in mind because I will refer to it at, at the very, uh, well, later on. So this is before any conservation treatment. To begin the conservation treatment, I removed the varnish by soaking it in ethanol. And now I will ask Holly to launch the question. There are uh, probably two possible replies. One of them is five points. And there's a 50 points reply. So be very attentive. <laughs> I'm just putting the question in now, Rita. For, so I'm putting a question into the chat box about this slide for you guys to have a good answering. Okay. Here we so go. the question is, what main difference 
do you, well, what differences do you see between the previous stage, which is the one on the corner, the small one, and the stage after varnish removal? And can, can I see the, the answers or you give them to me? You can try, if you, can you see, can you access the chat box, Rita, from your little menu? Chat. Ah, yeah, I can see. Okay, there oh, you go. transparency is gone. Yeah, <laughs> that's a five-point question. And we have five points to Ruth. <laughs> so, among all of you, we have... Oh, wait, hang on, hang on. Ah, oh, but I have a 50 point. Yeah. The rate has moved. Fantastic. Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin Kirshner gets 50 points. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, wow. We have so many points. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my doorbell is going. <laughs> better color contrast. Well, yeah, everyone is everyone is right. Thank you. So, uh, transparency is gone. That is the main question. Uh, there is a better black and white contrast, and uh, the red is gone. But it's not that it's gone. The red was always on the back side. So this is the back side, and this is the front side. So when they painted, the paper was translucent, so it didn't matter whether they did on the front or the back. But now that it's not translucent anymore, we only see it from the back. No one panics because this will be fixed. <laughs> okay. Ay, ¿qué pasa? Okay, so this, this is the pointing the difference. Uh, after removing the varnish, a regular wet treatment and the adhesification took place. And after that, it was lined from the backside with a Japanese tissue and starch paste. The pH after the acidification increase two points reaching neutrality so from five to seven which was really good and as for the lining you can see these wrinkles here this is the the lining which has some some wrinkles because of the different I mean, two layers and one layer so still we don't see the the coloring <laughs> and then the, 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 the lined document was varnished with paraloid at a concentration of 50 grams liter. And the, the color shows again from the front side, which is the, the has no lining. And some, some of you might be thinking, why would I varnish before the infills? And it's a really good question. Because the reason is that I want the infills to match exactly in intensity of color, well, in color, if I can, intensity of color and sheen. If I don't know the sheen of at, at, at the, at, after varnishing of the original, how can I match it? I cannot count that they will both shift in the same way because they will not that's why so i toned the uh, paper for the infills with watercolor i varnished the toned paper and leave it to dry and with that toned and varnished paper that already has a color that i'm happy with a, a sheen a gloss that i'm happy with then the infills were uh, placed on the original with Cluthel at a concentration of 5%. I think this is not in the notes. You can just, I mean, it's just Cluthel. Cluthel is there. So uh, if we watch closer, uh, I, the, the result is, is really nice because thanks to the fact that I could do the lining as a wet treatment, uh, I can do a really nice uh, alignment of the two sides of the tear. There are no tensions because the fibers swell and relax. And I got rid 
of the whitish thing. I mean, the, the coating, the cracked coating is not there anymore. So there's no whitish remnant of the coating at all. It's super effective. So that was uh, the, the study case which represents most the treatment, the general treatment. Let's discuss the pros and cons uh, of it. Transparency. Well, as, as you could see, or as you can see now, the transparency will be restricted to the layers we add. If we do a lining, as, as you can see in the image, the outcome is quite transparent. That's why the photo is taken with a black background. It's a bit less transparent, but I mean, it's a paper that was super fragmented, so I had no other choice. I will show you at the end another paper that was not lined, and then transparency is fantastic, it's the same. The color, as you can see, it's okay too. I mean, I can challenge myself as much time as I want to spend on, <laughs> on matching the color. And what about the scale? Because that is the main information of the document. So now I want you to recall that Mylar uh, trace that I did, which is this one. So this, I cut the, the Mylar in order to shape the infills. And I kept these pieces of Mylar. And this is once the paper was already in the archive. And as you can see, uh, there has been no variation at all of the scale because this is a, not a square angle so it would show really well if there had been any variation. My guess is that after so many years of oxidation the fibers are less ready to swell but I, I really cannot know why but the fact is that it's not a problem. What about yellowing? To which extent we can diminish the yellowing is related to two factors. First of all, the amount of varnish. If the paper has a very high concentration and a high amount of varnish and we remove it all, there will be more diminishing. If the paper has less varnish, there will be less difference, of course. But it is also relate, related to the oxidation degree of the paper. For instance, you can see in the map at your left that this square shows the inner fold. The inner fold is more protected, there is a bit less of oxidation, and therefore it's whiter it's not as yellow. Whereas this fold that was wrongly folded in the, in the outer side of the box where it was kept, uh, was more exposed to oxidation and therefore we could not diminish the yellowing as well as in other areas. The treatment was uh, exactly the same. It was all done at once, but the oxidation has not been the same. So this is the, these are the two reasons that might condition how much can we diminish the, the yellowing. Let's focus now on the detrimental, and well, we said that yellowing can sort of be a problem, but uh, let's focus now on the really jeopardizing features of the of the virus. So what about ongoing oxidation? To the extent that I have removed the cause of uh, oxidation, mm, I can say that there's no more oxidation. <laughs> 
I cannot really prove that because I can I don't have the resources to measure a poly, polymerization degree, for instance. That would be one way to check that. But I do can I, I do have uh, pH paper strips, and I can measure the consequences of this uh, oxidation, which is acidity. And if at the moment that we can deacidify, the acidity improves a lot. I mean, from five to seven, it's fantastic. This will be always conditioned to the fact that we can apply wet treatments, of course. And uh, the main point for me, which is brittleness. Ah, well, that was, sorry, that was related to the fact of the pH and that the paper really absorbs water after removal of the varnish. So, Mm, brittleness. So this is a video of the very same plan that I showed you in the beginning that I was trying to unfold without breaking. It's the same plan and it is flexible. The flexibility is not uh, due to the fact that it is lined because we know that the lining does not a miracle the condition of the paper has improved. And this enables us to do a really safe handling. There are other aspects of the conservation treatment that you might want to discuss as well. One of them is applicability. So, I don't want anyone to think that I am suggesting that we should remove the varnish in any case, in, in every map, systematically. Not at all. <laughs> uh, any, every case needs to be discussed uh, or thought at uh, individually, and it will depend on how damaged it is, uh, how important it is, uh, what's the function of the document? Uh, are there tapes? Uh, what's the technique? Many, many, many factors. And this um, drawing will be the next study case. And I, will, I want to share it with you because I didn't remove the varnish in that particular case. So we cannot uh, always apply this treatment. What about reversibility? Uh, the varnish is gone, and with it, all the mm, damages that it caused. If we want to keep a record of this varnish, uh, I, what, what we can do is take a, a piece of a Watman paper a, chromat a chromatography filter paper, and in the process of uh, solubil solubil in the process of removing the varnish with the solvent, we just soak this paper strip on the solvent, uh, on the solvent with the coating, and we have a sample. With this sample we can do as many analyses as we want forever. But not only uh, we can do analysis on the, on, the, on the very testimony of the original varnish, but we can even do more analysis than if we had never removed it. Because some analysis, you cannot really do them on the paper, on the original, because they are destructive. But the sample, with the varnish, we can take pieces of it and destroy it, of course. So it's, I wouldn't say it's a drawback. On the contrary, we have a sample that we can test it how, bueno, in, in many ways. 
And uh, what about toxicity? We want to be uh, friendly with our environment and we don't want our studio to be smelling <laughs> with toxic products. And you don't, you don't have to think that if I do a bath, a solvent bath on a big plan as the one that you have seen on the video, which was quite big. Um, it's not that I soak it in a swimming pool of ethanol or, or toluene. So you use the very mm, minimum amount that you need to swell the varnish and then a, a plastic on top to uh, avoid uh, evaporation. So you, you don't really need much. And not only because of the environmental, environmentally friendly aspect and, and the money that it can cost, but also in terms of efficiency, uh, it's much better to use very small amounts consecutively rather than using the sum of these amounts at once. For instance, if I use 50 millimeters of ethanol three times, the first time I have removed a lot of the varnish, but there is still some remnant. The second time, the remnant is um, very small. And the third time, and there is almost no remnant of varnish. On the other hand, if I use 150 millimeters once, there will be a lot of remnant of varnish after that. So my suggestion is that you use very few amounts in consecutive baths. So these are the examples before the treatment, the, the ones that you have, uh, that I have shown. And these are the after, uh, pictures, which I'm really satisfied. This one had plenty of tapes all over. Tapes, 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 tapes all over. They look good. Okay, so uh, now it's the main treatment. We are ready with that. And we will go to the third study case. Let me just drink a bit, a bit of water. Okay, so this study case, is this a cigar? No, this is not a cigar. <laughs> this is a very, very much rolled, impregnated tracing paper. And it belongs to the It belongs to the, an art center dedicated only to tapestry. I think it's the one in Spain or one of the very few in Spain dedicated only to tapestries. And they have an amazing collection of tapestries and designs uh, for them. And one of them is the one that you see. It's from the 20th century, and we don't know who's the author. And I was given this drawing because of the opening of this art center, and they, they wanted it restored to exhibit it. Okay, so this is the previous stage. And well, as you can see, it's uh, well, I tell you, it's made with charcoal, pastel, and wash. So, if pastel, charcoal, and wash, the three of them uh, have as a main feature opacity, I don't really want to assume the risk to alter this opacity in the process of removing the varnish, because there might be some diffusion 
of it uh, because of the solvent. And even if I thought that I will use a suction table or I will do an amazing, I will be extremely careful and there will be no diffusion of the varnish uh, on, on the charcoal, on the pastel, on the wash. How can I apply the varnish afterwards under, under the, the pastel, I mean on the paper, but not on the pastel? Uh, do I have to apply it only in, in, the, peri in the edges? It's not reasonable. I mean, it's not reasonable. This is an artwork. It's not meant to be handled. It's meant to be framed and to be watched. And we want to see it, well, not as it is, <laughs> because it's really damaged, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to be handled. So I just lined it. Um, I applied uh, some moisture really carefully and then lined it really, really carefully, of course. And even the lining, some might think that it's a too much interventive thing, but I thought it necessary. First of all, because it was so much cockle, you see all this... <laughs> I mean, you cannot force an object to be flat in, if you cannot provide some sort of water to it. And not only that, if it has to be framed, we don't want the framer to put uh, the artwork, the, the glass in contact with the pastel. And if the paper doesn't hold itself vertically at some point, mm, I mean, no. So that's why I lined, because we need someone, I mean, the paper, the Japanese paper, to hold the paper. And all the cracks that, the whitish cracks that you can see a bit less, it's not that they have improved at all, the only thing is that the loss of, trans, of uh, transparency due to the lining makes them less visible, but they are there. So there has been no improvement in the chemical condition on the paper, mm, no change on the yellowing, and we haven't stopped the oxidation. <laughs> I mean, it looks better. That was the main goal. But that's it. So this is the last case that uh, I will share with you today. The third one. Mm -hmm. The difference of this study case, as opposite to the ones that we have seen now, is that it's not in a really bad condition. I mean. The ones before were ruinous, but this one you can say, okay, this looks quite good, and yeah, you are right. This drawing was handmade by Luis Domenac y Montané, who is the main architect uh, from the modernism, uh, Catalan modernism, and well, most of the buildings that you will visit if you go to Barcelona, Hospital de Sant Pau, El Palau de la Música, were done by Luis Domènech i Montanet. So, main figure of uh, architecture in Catalonia. It's quite small and it's a graphite drawing. And that's the pre previous state. It belongs to the Association of Architects of Catalonia. And this board that you see, it was attached to it. So uh, I was asked to remove the paper from this board. And it was attached from only from one point in here, in, in the arrow. And the arrow 
also points this ballpoint pen inscription that I asked the architects, the association, I said, what, what about this? <laughs> and they said, look, Rita, if you can remove it, we'd appreciate that because this inscription does, does not belong to the object. It's quite recent. And not only that, but it's written on the back side. So you don't, I mean, you, you don't, you cannot even read it because it's upside down. So they said that if I could remove it, they, they would rather have it off. That's the detail of, of the same object. And this is the spot where the double-sided tape holding the paper to the board was on, on the back side that we cannot see in the previous tape. And also on the back side, there was another tape. And, and here, still another tape. Many, many tapes in a really small <laughs> drawing. So that's the spot where the paper was hold, held. And here I'm, I'm showing the other two tapes. I don't know if you can see the scotch tape here. So I first start removing the tape. And on the process of tape removal, I removed part of the inscription. You see here, it's where the tape was, the scotch tape. And this is the back side. And this is the scotch tape. So the inscription <laughs> was on the tape. It says Luis Domènech i Montaner, arquitecta. So the name and architect. So I removed the tape and the architect. So after removing the architect or part of it, I thought better to remove the whole thing because I, I didn't see the point on leaving only part of it. And in the red arrow points, the double-sided tape that was holding the paper on the board. So this is the process of removing the inscription that I did carefully with acetone. With a white background, it might not show that much. But with a black background, you can see to what extent transparency is affected. I mean, it, it turns to total opacity. So at this point, I had two options. Either I work only in the area that uh, has become opaque by adding some varnish in order to make it even with the rest of the paper or I remove all the varnish and then add another varnish. And I thought the second option was more reasonable because I don't see the point of, uh, I thought it, it's maybe too risky to have a difference of aging. No, I mean, how can we be sure that the new varnish will behave similarly to the old and there will be no stains in the recent future? And it's sort of impossible to, to have a nice result without uh, tide lines or marks of any way. So I just removed all the varnish and that's the detailed image after removing the inscription and the varnish. After the varnish removal, I just washed the paper normally. This tiny piece was here and there was another tape. So after removing the tapes, that's the part that just detached. So I washed and deacidified. And after that, I mended the tears. You see the 
fibers here, these fibers that you see, is because at this stage the, the tears have already been mended. And the video is showing the, the varnishing, the yellow paper that you see under, under the, the original is a silicone paper because we don't want the paper to be attached <laughs> on the table forever. And although it seems that I'm doing a messy work on it, um, it's because the evaporation of the varnish is sort of uneven and very fast. But you don't have to freak out because if, if you apply the varnish evenly, the result is nice. And the video, I mean, I'm never uh, as fast as that. It's speed up a lot. And this is another video that shows all the stages. So this is after removing the tapes and the varnish. After wet cleaning, you see that it has already whitened a lot more. Then it was flattened and mended and revarnished again. And if we compare the, with the previous stage, we see that there has been a significant diminishing of yellow, although it was not that obvious in the, in the beginning. And as you can see, transparency is well kept. I mean, it, it has a really similar transparency. So no tapes, no ballpoint um, pen inscription, no acidity, and new varnish. That's uh, <laughs> the fee <laughs> for this result. Oh, and not attached on the board, which was the, the main thing. Okay, so <laughs> I will have a last bit of water. <laughs> mm. We have seen the study cases. We have um, discussed the pros and cons of the, of the treatment. And now we will uh, see whether this treatment is pertinent or not. Because, as I said, this is something we need to discuss uh, for, for each particular case. I have done this sort of uh, table. So every docu document is different. And uh, the main, so we can call meaning the it has a different meaning. So the meaning would be its context, no? which uh, text is, uh, does it have. But not only the, the text, but also the collection uh, provides uh, a meaning to, to this object or a function, because if, if um, an architectural drawing belongs to an archive, and it's a public archive meant to be uh, visited by, by anyone, then it has a much different fun function than a document that belongs to an art collection and they only exhibit them from time to time. No? So even with uh, similar documents, to which collection they belong, provides them different functions. So we have the meaning, in the first column, the function in the second column, second column. I, I will go to the colors right now. I just hold on <laughs> for this. <laughs> and the condition of the object, the, can vary um, or modify the value of each document. Because if the document is very much damaged, of course, it has less value. If it cannot be uh, consulted, or I mean, if we cannot exhibit it, I mean, what's the point? 
the condition of the object modifies the value. So these first three rows would explain how valuable the object is. And the colors. So it's sort of a um, traffic light uh, symbology. Red would mean either too a lot or too risky. No? So objects belonging to ar um, archives, which are usually most handled, I put in red because they suffer a more intensive handling. And regarding condition, well, it's sort of obvious. It is super damaged, then red. <laughs> so we have the value of the document in the three rows. And us, as conservators, we will do an effort in order to improve the value of this document. I mean, that's our goal. I mean, the cost of uh, our salaries, let's say, <laughs> are meant to uh, have a, an improvement on, on this value. The idea is that this effort is worth the result. I mean, if we are doing a huge effort, but the benefit is not worth, then we shouldn't do it. So, in the case of the two first study cases, the two of them belong to archives. Uh, so, it's technical drawings, it's not um, artwork. I mean, they are really nice, but it's not main art uh, documents. It's historical documents that will be handled and they have a, a very high damage. The treatment that uh, we have, uh, that they have gone through, the removal of the varnish is an effort. I mean, you don't do this in five minutes, but the benefits, I think it's worth. It can be safely handled. It has long lasting preservation expectations because we will, I mean, we have uh, improved the chemical, the physical condition, the visual. I mean, I think it's worth the effort. I mean, these drawings were in a drawer excluded from, from the public and, and then after that, they can be checked. So, what about the second drawing? It's a historical document as well. Uh, we don't know the author, but it's a really nice one. <laughs> so, it has more artistic interest or well, well, I don't want to, yeah, it has an artistic interest. It belongs to a museum. So, the museum has different needs than the archive. And it should not be mm, offered to researchers that often. The condition is as bad as the previous ones. And what effort did we do on them? I put yellow instead of uh, red because we, we did not remove the varnish. Mm, so, yeah, I mean, it, it took us an effort not to do, I mean, I didn't do that in five minutes either, but it, the, the intervention was not as uh, intensive. So the effort is smaller, so the results are not, uh, I mean, are proportional to this uh, small effort. Uh, it hasn't improved the chemical condition, we haven't stopped ongoing oxidation, but it can be exhibited. So we achieved our goal and we don't want to risk two treatments that we, we don't know the result. And what about the last study case? And this is maybe the most interesting, and I don't know, probably more controversial or, or not, no sé, you will tell me. <laughs> 
So this is a historical document with main artistic interest or, or main, main historical interest because of the reason that we know who did it. And it's a really important person, it's an artist. The drawing belongs to the Association of Architects and I mean, they, they offer um, their collection to researcher, researchers, but they might uh, lend them on exhibition and that was the case. So in this case, the object uh, was restored because of the exhibition. The condition, it's rather good. I mean, of course, is not comparable to the previous ones. But it's not perfect because it has tapes and it has a ballpoint pen inscription. And precisely because we are dealing with a most important document, I think that these tapes and this ballpoint pen inscription, we could consider them as, um, as a more important damage. Because, because the paper is more important. If I have the same tapes on an account um, record, well, no? <laughs> I know we'll, we'd be, it will be oxidized after time, but I'm not that worried. But this is a drawing from Domenac y Montané. So I don't want to assume the risk of an oxidizing tape or a ballpoint pen inscription of 20 year old that is not uh, providing any information. So, what's the effort I invested on treating the object? Object. Uh, I, I used yellow. I mean, of course I removed the varnish. If someone says that they consider that I should say this is red because I removed the varnish was okay, I agree. I mean, we, we can agree on that. I just put um, yellow instead of red because I didn't do any lining, but, but we, we could say it's an intensive treatment. I think the object is worth, I mean, in any case, I, either red or yellow. I think the object is worth, and I think the outcome is worth, because the visual aspect has improved. We, we don't have the, the, the inscription anymore. We don't have the text that will be damaging the object anymore, and, and we don't have it attached on a board forever and ever. <laughs> we have reduced uh, yellowing, and I mean, we don't see that, but the chemical condition of the paper has improved as well. So this paper will endure much more than if we didn't have, if we didn't remove the varnish. So this sort of um, way to value, no, the the way that we decide to do things. Uh, I recommend you this article by, I cannot pronounce this, Brokerhoff, <laughs> Kemp Abulo. I took it a bit from there. And I also took it a bit from this blog post of my own blog <laughs> that relates to decision making in conservation. And these are the, the references that I promised. All these articles relate to or speak at some point of impregnant, impregnated tracing papers. I, these are other references that you might want to check as well. They are not related to impregnated tracing paper, but they do speak about plans and maps and tracing paper and archive collections. So you might want to check at them. 
Uh, I also recommend that you check uh, Antonio Mirabile's website because he has many papers on, on the conservation of translucent paper. And these are the references of the, of the videos on my YouTube channel related to, to this and of the um, blog post or projects, all of them related to the objects that, that we have seen today and other tracing papers. And uh, just wanted to let you know that the, this lecture will be published in a, in, by the University of Granada and the moment I have it published in Spanish, I will translate it and I will post it on my blog at, at this link, which is not available now, but it will with, the, with this lecture as a paper, so you can check on it in the future. And these are my contact details in case you want to yeah, to keep in touch or you want to email and I'm ready to reply any questions you might have and I hope you found it interesting and no one felt asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much Rita. <laughs> that was a really wonderful talk and um, I've just posted in the chat a link to um, the slides so that anyone who wants to get uh, those references, they can copy them from there. So you don't have to worry about copying them out. Um, we've got loads of questions already. Um, I'm gonna give about 10 minutes for questions just so that you know we've all got um, homes to go to, even though we're kind of already in them. But um, so, and some of them kind of follow similar lines. So I'm gonna group some of them together if that's okay. Um, yeah. So the first group of questions is about um, the varnish, the, new, the uh, conservation varnish that you used, um, which was Paraloid B72, right? Um, a few people wanted to know what was the solvent that you used to dissolve the Paraloid in, and also whether you um, use other varnishes at all, or if it's always Paraloid, and whether you consider other varnishes in, to apply in that way. Uh, yeah, I, I used, I think, toluene um, to apply the, the paraloid. And yes, I, I have tried other varnishes. And I, of course, yeah, I have tried other varnishes that I didn't like the result. Usually varnishes meant to be applied on paper, um, they, they don't intend to make the paper translucent. So the, the result, no, I, I was not happy with the result. However, mm, I'm happy to try other ones. So I'm happy that others um, try other things and let me know. I mean, if someone finds another one that they think it's better because whatever, I mean, it's not that I, that Paraloid supports me at anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've got then another group of questions about, for the second case study, so the, the, um, the decorative tracing paper with the gouache and the pastel, um, how did you humidify it and what did you use to adhere the lining to the back? Uh -huh. So yeah that was a really tricky conservation treatment. I made a sort of a sandwich with a, a first a blotter soaked in water on the table, second a Gore-Tex, then the artwork facing up of course then I put some objects uh, and the plastic on top and the objects were meant that there were no contact at all on the, on the pastel. Mm. And like this, I just left it to moisture for, I don't know, whatever. Uh, then I lined 
the Japanese tissue for the lining. Ah, I didn't say that, but I think, yeah, I varnished the lining before because I thought that if my lining was already a bit translucent, maybe the result would be less opaque. So I varnished a uh, Japanese tissue, I let it dry, then I um, pasted it with starch paste and I put the paper on the lining. So usually you line from the back side, but I didn't this time. I lined <laughs> so the other way, no? Because you don't want to apply pressure on the pastel. Uh. And I left it to dry, not by tension, but sort of. And it was, when it was not super dry, but mm, a bit moist, then I flattened it. I mean, not when it was super moist because I didn't want the uh, pigment to fall off. Mm. So that was it. Great. Thank you. Um, let me just work through. So there's a few people asking about um, um, what in your work on treating transparent papers and um, have you come across things where inks and stamps that are fugitive um affected your ability to apply these treatments and a kind of um questions about how you're how you're testing those and um how that affects your decision making uh-huh the thing is that i have worked on only a few impregnated tracing paper and none of them had stamps because I don't know what would I do if there was a stamp. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, no, I haven't come. Up, I mean, I have worked with uh, plans and maps that have stamps, but not coated papers with so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's already so difficult. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to know that I have not come across this yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. And um, we've got uh, Laurent Crevelier who has asked ah. a very comprehensive number of questions. Um, oh, just great. because there are so many people who've asked questions, I'm, I'm only going to ask um, one or two from from them because just so that it's fair and everyone gets a chance to ask um a question um so let's have a look do, do, do. yeah so um they've asked when you apply a varnish again are you fixing some media how do you make sure that they won't fade so for example with graphite's reflectance which can change dramatically if it's being if the varnish is removed um or how do you make sure they don't disappear later if a new solvent bath is applied in the future to remove the paraloid? Oh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so, so it's, it's, the varnish affects the, the media. So when you're applying the, the new varnish, um, do you take measures to help fix the media to make sure that it doesn't uh -huh. move when no, you're no, applying no. the new varnish? No, uh, usually I, I don't like fixing, no. Mm, I'm, I'm just careful because I think most of the time, well, not always, not always, but fixing might involve even more risks than not. And the solvent itself, if the, it's not, well, I don't, I don't see that solvent is harmful for pastel, wash, or graphite. I mean, these te techniques are very mm, not uh, reacting with the solvent. Watercolor does not react with the solvent at all. It remains, I mean, watercolor reacts with water, not with the solvent. The stamp would really be a problem. And graphite, mm, 
uh, well, the, the, the last drawing that was a graphite, uh, I didn't really see uh, a difference on the sheen of the graphite. Maybe if it had been a silver point or... I, I haven't noticed any issues on this regard, but... Sorry, I've just noticed, Rita, that Laurent has written in uh, the chat, so if you can still see the chat box, um, they've uh, written their question. When you apply a varnish again, you are fixing some media. How do you make sure that they won't fade? or disappear later if a new solvent bath is applied in the future to remove the paraloid? They won't fade or disappear. Well, mm, the thing is that the graphite, I mean, of course, if, if you varnish a graphite, a watercolor, uh, all this media is more embedded embedded on the document than it had ever been. I mean, of course, and that is a change. So, uh, but I, I must say that uh, this is sort of an experimental treatment that I have been working on. And in some occasions I have removed <laughs> Uh, well, in one occasion, I needed to remove the varnish that I applied myself because I didn't like the sheen. And it was not a problem. Mm, I mean, of course, all these things are risky and hazardous, but I think not more than any other conservation treatment that we are doing but or disappear. I, I, I wouldn't think it will disappear. I'm reading again, Lawrence. Disappear later if a new solvent bath is applied in the future. No, because I mean, if, if you have used a solvent to remove the original varnish, uh, the, for instance, if, if I want to remove paraloid, I might use toluene as well. And um, I would say, I mean, usually the, the solvent that you want to use to remove the original varnish will have very similar properties to the ones that will remove the new varnish. So if you didn't have issues first, you, you might not have them later on. I, I mean, I consider every case, um, individually I, if i thought uh, and i myself never do anything that i can't undo because i sometimes do mistakes <laughs> and for me this is reversibility i work to the extent that i am confident that um, this either will look okay or if it doesn't i will be able to go backwards and of course, reversibility, full reversibility does not exist. But, uh, well, it's a matter of finding a balance of benefits and risks. But yeah, it's true that the media gets more embedded than it had ever been because of the varnish. That, that is true. And that is why I didn't do anything on the pastel. Yeah, you have to take all those things into consideration, don't you, before deciding yeah. to take on that treatment. Thank you. Um, just a couple more questions we've got time for. Um, quite a few people have asked, what Japanese papers are you using for lining these impregnated papers? Mm, mm, I, I don't know the name, but <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I have been using uh, one that is nine grams for the very much damaged objects. And it's not, um, I mean, it's a um, rolled one. So it's not handmade. It's one that you buy on a roll. It, it's a Japanese tissue sort of not, uh, and well, and in case of tracing papers, you don't want to use 
the handmade because the fibers are more visible. So it's better to use um, more machine-made Japanese tissues. They match more similarly the texture of the papers themselves. Yeah. Really. Um, there's a couple of people who've asked what kind of plastic you're using to wrap the when you're um, removing the varnish. If you're using um, acetone to wash out the varnish, what's the plastic that you're using to wrap it? Ah. <laughs> I don't know. It's a plastic. Something that doesn't <laughs> dissolve in something that doesn't yeah. dissolve in acetone. <laughs> It's a plastic that doesn't dissolve in the solvent. Yes, you <laughs> see. <laughs> Great. <laughs> it's Thank not you. the kind of plastic that you buy to protect furniture when you paint the wall, because I uh, think that one, that one, no, that one dissolves. Yeah. But you, I mean, you find whatever plastic that uh, works. No, say yeah. I don't know. Thank you. And then just one last question. There's a couple of people who've talked about at the end of your talk, how you, in your final table, you talked about the effort that goes into the treatments. Um, and how do you, how do you define effort conservation wise? And how do you kind of qualify that effort in terms of your table? And that, That's a good question. I would say that this effort, in this effort, we could include two different things. One of them is the cost, how much the conservation treatment costs. Mm -hmm. and, and the second one is how, may, how much uh, interventive is it with the object? No? Because maybe we spend, no say, ages removing dust with a vacuum cleaner and it's whatever cost, and it's not the same as if we deacidify. It's more interventive. So yeah, I would say the effort is both. No, how much it costs, because that's the our reality. <laughs> mm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, I mean the the object is worth this money. That's the thing. And also regarding uh, the ontology. Uh, is it uh, pertinent to go this far to reach this goal? So I would say these two things. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, wonderful, okay. So I just, uh, I'm sorry, there's still a lot of questions in there. I'm, I'm sorry for all of the people whose questions we haven't had time to address, but as you can see um, on the last slide, Rita's put her email address there. So do um, contact her directly with your questions or you can also use the hashtag conservation together at home to ask them on social media and then um, we can continue the conversation on there. Um, so I just wanted to quickly just say that the next talk in the series, um, which will be hosted by the Heritage Science Group, is going to take place tomorrow, which is Wednesday, at 4 p.m. British summer time. And the talk is going to be Catelyn Southwick, who is the founder and executive director of Key Culture, Sustainability and Conservation. And she's talking about sustainability and cultural heritage, our past and our future, which is a very important subject. So hopefully we'll see you all there tomorrow. And so then it just leaves me to say thank you so much, Rita, for your talk. It was super interesting. And as if you have a chance to have a look at the comments, there's just loads of really positive comments um, for you there. I will. <laughs> and um, thank you to everyone for coming. Um, and I'm going to end the webinar there.